I pray that Nkulunkulu will reward you for your faithfulness, amen. And to the newly elected council, I want to send my greetings to you. And I'm trusting Nkulunkulu that he is also going to give you the grace that you need for you to continue with this responsibility of leading this massive organization, amen. Yeah. And we give God praise for you. And even some of you who are still contemplating whether to or not, I want to let you know that you're missing out. You are missing out. Don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. You know, there's something about God. God is so smart. God always hides greatness in self. God hides greatness in self. And I might even need it even more from a biblical point than just be in a natural sense. The man that we celebrate now on July, I believe the 17th, we even have 60 days. No, 60, 60 minutes that we attribute to his life in his absence. The only thing that made him what he was, what he is, is because he served. He laid down his life just to serve what he, not even to serve in the kingdom per se, but to serve humanity. And today, even in his absence, years after he has passed on, on his birthday, the whole world stands still just to celebrate what? Somebody who serves. And here we are, most of us are busy praying for greatness. And your greatness is not in your prayer life. It's in your willingness to serve. You missed it. Greatness is not in your fasting. It's in your savings. That's why Jesus said, if you want to be great, he didn't say go pray and fast. He said find a place to serve. So I just want to encourage you that this is a good ground for you to offer yourself to serve and watch God, watch it make up for you what seems like the time you would have lost by being part. There's a blessing of acceleration. I'm what I am today, all that we have had that has been read, I'm what I am not because of anything special that I've done. But the only thing that I've done, I picked up the principle of serving. I've been serving as a worship leader from the age of 11. I've served for 33 years. This is my 33 years serving as a worship leader. What I was doing, get to church and play keyboard and sing. People get blessed, they go home, next week I come here, they play and sing. Little did I know that it's in that serving that God will open doors that even my parents couldn't have paid to get me to. Serving will accelerate your life. And at the time, actually, I had a privilege to study music. I studied at the Eastside College, I studied with, Jesus, with the Chesil brothers, Mubeg and Ndobeg, those who were my classmates. Sipokazi, she was my classmate. The Kuala Teta, the three brothers from Sori, who were playing the flute, those were my classmates, and so on and so on. I studied with them music. But because I had the heart to serve God with my gift, when they got their breakthrough in the secular world, I came back and I served in the house of the Lord. At the time when I was in church and they were traveling the world, it looked like I'm losing. It looked like I'm falling behind. But there's something you need to understand. The Bible talks about us being an arrow in God's bow. For an arrow to, to be shot further ahead, <laughs> it needs to be pulled further backward. At the time when it looks like this church thing is pulling me back, what I mean, I'm sure it's cut. And the day they were on the crowd, on the metro, I was doing and all that. Yeah, I mean, the keep a good prayer meeting and they are traveling the world. It looked like nothing is coming out of me. But you know, God was just pulling me back a little bit. And they came and said, 2015, God let me go. Now the world is my stage. Not because of anything special, but because of serving. So I just encourage you that run. Run. The Bible gives us the three R's. It says, write with the vision, make it plain, so that those who read it may run. So the vision is written. We know the vision is written. So you read it every night, every Sunday night, you read it. And the quick, you know, what are you waiting for? Why are you not running? Even the Bible instructs you to run. The Bible doesn't allow you to read the, written, the, the vision to be written and read and you just leave it there. It's been written, we read it. 
What are you waiting for? Run. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, why aren't you running? Why aren't you running? Amen. And why am I saying this? Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because I've seen, I've seen a lot of people who have served at Kev. When I look at their life today, God is using them amazingly. Because there's a blessing in there. Amen. So let's get to work for tonight. Amen. Are you ready for the word of God? Yeah. How many of you were blessed too than the previous two weeks that we were here? Yeah. I was blessed. Man, I was blessed. I went back on YouTube and I watched that thing again. And I was like, really, really, God really opened up our eyes and he has helped us. Amen. And I just want to pick up from there. But tonight I have a different task that I want to approach in the 39 minutes. I want to give us now a theoretical aspect of that practical truth. At times we come to a gather, worship gathering and the power of God, you know, like overwhelms us. And in most religious settings, it ends up becoming a one-time thing. It becomes an encounter of that week. It's not something that we can sustain by ourselves. Amen. My brother, for tonight, I'm going to ask you just to drop it because I'm a musician, like I just told you. So every time he's playing, I'm hearing sounds and I want to compose a song. So I want to keep myself here. Yeah. So don't be too far. I'm going to call you just before I close up. So I hear he's playing some nice sounds, man. And I'm hearing that musical angel coming. So I want to stop the music angel and keep the teaching one. Amen. So that I can focus. Because today, I just want to give you, it's, it's a study, it's a research that I've done for the past seven years. But the Lord has not even released me to put it, to publish it in the form of the book. Because there's a lot of death in worship that the church has not gone to. When I was here two weeks back, number one, I mentioned that worship is the oldest practice and yet the most misunderstood. I had a privilege to speak with one of the professors at UNISA who is teaching the subject of worship to the second year Bible students. Bible studies. Students who are doing Bible studies at UNISA. And one of the things that I brought across to him is that I think the biggest disservice that is done by most Bible institutions is that Bible institutions that are preparing people to pastoral office who are going to start churches, they don't teach them true biblical worship. Now we are raising people who are going to start ministries and in those ministries worship has to be the culture. In other words, worship is one of the pillars of every religious gathering or religious ministry. And yet we don't teach them true biblical worship. That's the reason why in most churches we've got more slow songs than worship. We've got more songs than the actual worship. Because what we have is, is a concept that was passed down to us from previous generation, which based on the biblical research that I've done, it needs to be revisited. In the Bible, the New, the, the New King James Version, which is my Bible study, there are 197 verses, I mentioned the previous time that I was here, that has got the four words, worshipped, worshippers, worshipping, and worship. In all 197 verses, the context is never singing or music. In other words, the worshippers of the Bible, they don't sing. <clears throat> worshippers of the Bible, they don't sing, but they give up something. Remember, we learned in the first mention the previous ones I was here. If you're not here, please go back to the YouTube so you can catch up so that I don't eat my time for tonight. Amen. I mentioned that the first mention of worship is in Genesis 22 verse 5. And the Bible says, Abraham said to the servant, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and return. What Abraham meant, he did not mean I'm going to sing slow songs. But he meant I'm going to kill what I love. In obedience to the one I honor. Therefore, we drew a conclusion that your worship is not complete until something that you love dies. Your worship is not complete until something that you treasure dies. To make it worse, before God instructed Abraham to sacrifice Isaac in Genesis 22, the preceding chapter, God commanded Abraham to get rid of Ishmael. Ishmael was Abraham's firstborn through Hagar. Isaac was Abraham's child through Sarah. Before God commanded Abraham to offer his son through Sarah, God commanded him to banish his son through Hagar. Why? I'm glad you asked. If it's going to be my worship, I don't want you to have plan B. 
It's all or nothing. So you see this kind of worship that we offer and we've got something else to fall back on. It's not the kind. True biblical worship has got nothing else to fall back on. Why? Because God wants, He wants to be the one that you fall back on. He doesn't want you to have other things. I'm not sure if I mentioned that last time. If I did, then God. If I did it, then it's my pleasure to say. God does not even want to be number one in your life. God is not looking for the number one spot. Because if he's number one, the assumption is there is number, he has a runner. <laughs> he doesn't want to be like Miss Universe. <laughs> if anything happens to her, somebody's going to come and take the crown. No, no, no. God, has, God is not interested, of the, he's not interested to be number one. He wants to be the only. He wants to be on the class by himself. So there's no competition. That's why he said to Abraham, actually, before I even see Ishmael, no, Isaac, get rid of this one. Why? Because I really want to test your heart. Now that you've got the son you've always wanted, the very thing you waited 25 years for, will you give it up at my instruction? Watch it. Anything you can give up for God has become your idol. Your refusal to part with it is an indication to God that it's more important to me than you. Are there any friends God has been telling you to part ways with? Yes. And you're like, no, I don't. I know we are good in our law. Watch it. It's not everything that God should share that's going to take you there. Thank God it brought you here. But for you to get to God's purpose for your life, you've got to give up some stuff. And one thing about worship that you need to understand, worship is God's way for us to share of the Lord for where he's calling us to. Amen. So quickly, let me talk to you on the subject I've entitled, Hand I said, you see, I love this silence. So, what? so please don't feel pity for me. I, I, I'm not the kind of speaker that is pumped up by, Amen, I receive. Say it again. You see, as you're saying like this, this is how I love my classroom. So I'm not only happy that it started like this. So that at least I can make sure that it gets through. To, because tonight I really want us to think about how then do we keep worship going on in the absence of the worship team? How do we keep this fire going? Because he has watching. According to the Bible, according to Sound biblical study. Worship is not a public affair. But worship is a private matter. That's why Abraham said to the servants who were accompanying him, he said, stay here with the donkeys. Now that I see the place, you stay here at the bottom. Up there, I'm going to go alone. Why? Because in the place of worship, spectators are not welcome. Because worship has only got one, an audience of one. Which is the law. That is why even in the tabernacle, the tabernacle had the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. From the outer court, there was crowd. A lot of noise. There were people on the queue waiting for their sacrifices to be offered. There was noise in the outer court. The noise of people who are celebrating the grace and the mercy and the noise of the animals that are dying. In the outer court, there's too much noise. But when you come in the holy place, the noise dies out. When you come to the Holy of Holies, it's only the worshiper and the recipient of worship. So the closer you get to God, the smaller your circle becomes. The closer you get to God, the smaller your circle becomes. And that's what worship intends to do. It intends to get you to a place where it's just you and God. Because it's in worship where God wants to form something in you. So now I want to talk to you on this subject when I the five elements of true biblical worship. The five elements of true biblical worship. Every worship scenario in the Bible has got five elements that encapsulates that experience. And I want you tonight to live at least with the knowledge of these five elements which will help you maintain worship all by yourself. Remember, in Genesis 22, so we're going to read three scriptures that I'm going to use as my, as my point of reference. We're going to read Genesis 22, verse 5. 
We're going to read Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, and Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Churchill, why all these scriptures? I'm glad you asked. In 2 Corinthians 13, verse 1, Paul gives us an instructions. We will stand in front of people and teach the way. He said, you need at least two or three witnesses to establish a sound biblical doctrine. In other words, Ungam Fumel Umunta Kunel again for Sali One. One verse doctrine is dangerous. Amen. Oh, they don't believe me. Okay. <laughs> One verse doctrine. Paul says we must give it at least two or three. If you find one verse and they come to your dormitory and say, God is speaking, and they show one verse, ask him, where's the second proof? <laughs> no, 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 it's this one. It is only one. Tell them, please, go shelf that revelation. Don't share it. Because one verse revelation is dangerous. Mm -hmm. You need two or three witnesses to establish sound biblical doctrine. Let me prove the danger of one verse revelation. Oh my time, watch it. There's a pastor, there's a church in Pretoria. When the pastor found one verse, he read Hosea chapter 4, verse 6 in the Good News translation. In the Good News, it says, My people are doomed for lack of knowledge. The men of God read again. My people are doomed for lack of knowledge. Is that the good news? Oh, I thought you had the good news. My people are doomed. Hosea 4 verse 6. In the good news. It says, my people are doomed. The man of God read again. My people are doomed. On Sunday morning when he went to church, he started a big pain. He wants to do the way. To buy tombs. And he came to church. The Bible says, read man. My people are doomed. So everybody who lacks knowledge, you must come in front. <laughs> One verse of Revelation is dangerous. So now, let's read Genesis 22 verse 5. So now what I'm, I'm just going to jump into, or maybe before we read, let me give you the five elements. The first element of worship, okay, maybe let me define elements first. The Miriam Method Dictionary defines an element as one of the parts that make up a whole. So I'm submitting to you tonight that worship has got five different parts that make up the encounter of worship. So as a worshiper, you must be mindful of all these five. Because your ignorance of the five renders your worship unacceptable. You must be mindful of that. So an element, oh, come on now. I, 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 really, I, today I, want, I, really, I really want to behave. I want to deliver this as a lecture and we close. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So an element is one of the parts that make up a whole. Number two, an element is, what is, is a particular part of something, such as a situation of an activity. So worship as an activity has got five different parts, and I'm submitting that to you, and I'm going to prove it to you in Scripture, how by going to, to biblical accounts where there are people who are worshiping, let's read the text, it tells us they are worshiping, and let's identify those parts so you can be able now to take a historical biblical account identify the part and then we bring it into a modern context so that you can do by yourself and in your room what Abraham did 2,000 years ago because God says he's the same yesterday, today and forever so if he did for Abraham he can still do it for you but for him to do it for you like he did it for him you must do it like he did it you must be mindful of what he was mindful of your ignorance of what Abraham was mindful of is what is costing us the blessing Abraham got in worship. So number three, an element, watch it now. Elements are defined as, I love this part. It says, it's a, a substance which when combined form a particular mixture. So I'm saying to you that worship as an encounter, worship as an experience, or worship as something God commands us to offer to him has got five different elements. Now the overarching principle is that all five elements must be right or your worship is unacceptable. Now, church, what are the five elements? If you're writing down, let's walk now. The first element of worship is what I call the worship. What is the worship? The worship is the recipient of worship. The worship is the one to whom worship is due. Remember the principle. All elements must be right or the experience is rejected. It, it means that as you offer your worship, you must make sure you are worshiping the right of the worthy recipient. 
No wonder then God helps us. He said, do not have any other God. Because if you worship other gods, you might be sweating at church, you might be dancing, you might be tempering, but if the recipient is not the worthy one, your sweat will never yield the right results. Number two, the second element is what, I, is, 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 is what the Bible calls the worshiper. So the first element is the worship, the recipient. The second element is the worshiper. What is the worshiper? The worshiper is the respondent. Remember, the worship is the recipient. The worshiper is the respondent. The worshiper is the one from whom worship is commanded. The worship is the one to whom worship is due. The worshiper is the one from whom worship is commanded. That's the worship. Number three, the third one is what I call the worship. So the worship recipient the worshiper responded, then the worship. What is the worship? The worship, now stay with me, watch now. The worship is the gift that the worship commanded from the worshiper. The worship is the thing that the worship commands from the worshiper. Meaning the worship is the requirement of worship. Is the thing that if you don't bring what God commanded, then your worship becomes unacceptable. So we have the worship, the recipient. We have the worshiper, the one who gives. We have the worship, the thing that is being brought. So the worship is the gift that the worshiper brings to the worshipped. Number four. The fourth element is what I refer to as the workshop. So we have the worship. We have the worshiper, we have the worship, then we have the workshop. What is the workshop? I'm glad you asked. The workshop is the place where the worshiper brings the worship to the worshipped. The workshop is the place of transaction. So churches, how do we identify the workshop? You okay. told her I'll be workshop when I'm saying, Kai, I mean, one of me. Watch it now. Here's the principle that overacts the workshop. The workshop is anywhere the recipient of worship decides to dwell. Meaning, the workshop, the place of interaction, is not decided by the worshiper. The place of the dating spot is not decided by the worshiper, but it's decided by the one who receives. Because remember, the worshiper is the one who's commanded. So in the instruction, in the command, there's the detail of where we're going to meet. Watch it, ladies and gentlemen. The worst mistake you can make in worship is to try to worship God in a spot he used to be. And that is, that is the danger of tradition. The first big encounter, the first personal encounter Israel had with God was in Mount Sinai. And after God said, you've been at this place for too long. It's time to break camp. Let's move on to the next level. And God moved them from that mountain to another mountain. The worst thing you can do is to say, I can tell about Nukun Kosa Sinai. Go back to Sinai. You are only being traditional. That's where God used to be. That's why the book of, the book of Hebrews, when it talks about the dating spot, it says, watch it now. We are not the ones who worship on Mount Sinai. Yeah. But we are the ones who worship on Mount Zion. Sure. Because God declared, he said, changing, I'm changing my dating spot. Mm. Mount Zion, watch it, will be my dwelling place. So if you want me where I used to be, who's the game? You will do the motions of worship, but you won't get the outcomes of worship. This is the reason why most of us come to worship gatherings. We do the worship motion. We lift up our hands, but still our lives are not surrendered. We sing.
talking about surrender at church, but when you look at the way we live during the week, there are not elements of the surrendered life. Because we are just being traditional. We are not being revelational. So the workshop is the dating spot. And I'm going to take you to these three scriptures. So we see the, the recipient of worship telling you, this is where we're going to meet. That's why Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, John 4, a time is coming. When you will no longer. The woman was asking Jesus, Jesus, which is the dating spot? The tabernacle in Jerusalem or this mountain where our fathers used? And Jesus said, oh, baby, girl, come on, let me help you quick. <laughs> let me help you quick. A time is coming where you will neither, where you will no longer worship the father, watch it, in the tabernacle in Jerusalem or this mountain, meaning your mother is going to change the meeting spot. So it means you need revelation now for God to tell you, this is where we come to meet. And I submit to you, God has changed the dating spot. And it's only those who know him, watch it, it's only those who have a personal, ongoing, vibrant relationship with him that we know where we meet him on Sunday. Number one, the worship, the recipient. Number two, go with me. Number two is the worship. worshiper. In class. Number three is the worship. Number four is the workshop. The fifth element is what I call the workmanship. That's the fifth one. So your worship encounter or your worship activity must have all these five elements. The worship is the recipient, the one to whom worship is brought. The worshiper is the one who brings the worship. The worship is the thing commanded by the recipient from the respondent. Then the workshop is the place of transaction. The workmanship is the reason for the activity. What is a workmanship? Watch it. Now let's look at let's define a workmanship and then we come to scriptures. We identify the five elements and I come to my close. Workmanship, let me define it for you quickly. The medium most dictionary defines work, the word workmanship, watch it, as something effected or something that is being made or something that is produced or the work of. So when I talk about the, workman, the workmanship of worship, I'm talking about God's original intent, why he commanded you to offer what he asked from you. So there's a reason why God commands you to give. And the reason why God commands you to be holy, that the reason why God commands you to serve is because it's in your activity of giving that something is effected in you. It's in your activity of doing what he commands that some work is being produced. I love this definition. Watch this. The second definition of the word workmanship, it says, workmanship is the quality imparted to a thing in the process of making so I submit to you that as we worship God, it's not just about goosebumps. Hey, my name is me, don't mind. No, 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 no. I was, you've been worshiping for the past three years. All that you get in, though. What did you say, No, no, there's more to worship than just in, though. That is why even if I'll feel it in, though, when you understand the truth, you're not calling it a yeah. There's something that's happening in your sheep. That's why God wants you to kill what you love. Because it's in the killing of what you love that the formation of what he has destined manifests. Yeah. Listen, the Bible says, the Bible refers to us as the offspring of Christ. That we are the children that Christ bore. So if we are the offspring of Christ, it means we have the DNA of Jesus. Still, we are going somewhere. So when the Bible speaks about Jesus, it presents him as the lion and the say with the lion and the. So in the in the Christocentric DNA, there's a lion and a lamb. That's why when John introduced him, he didn't say there is the lion. No, he said behold the what? The lamb of God. Because when we are born, we are born as lambs. But in the lamb, there's a lion. No wonder they say the book of Corinthians, it says, had they known, they would not have crucified him. 
Because they thought they were killing the lamb. God, it's in the death of the lamb where the lion will arise. That's why the lion in you will never manifest until the lamb that you love is still alive. Oh my goodness. That only spoils another sermon. That's why when you're in a church service or a worship gathering, the lion in you is being spoken to. And you feel something within you that says, I can do it. Something is again, I can make it. Something is I can withstand this storm. Something is again, you know, I can survive this in church. But the moment we say amen, the lion goes to bed. <laughs> because the message is only trying to mirror to the lamb you are of the lion you have within. But it's only when the lamb is offered, when the lamb dies, then the lion roars. That's the DNA we have. So all of us, we have the courage. All of us, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But we must be crucified as Christ first. That's why Jesus, before the crucifixion, he had to knock on doors. He had to ride on the boat. But when he rose from the grave, he never knocked on doors. He walked through walls. There are certain things that you won't be able to walk through until the land, the land you are. First dies. Now let's go to the scripture. Now, what are we doing now? I've given you the five elements: the worship, the worshiper, the worship, the workshop, and the workmanship. Now we're going to the scripture. Let me Genesis 22, verse 5. Genesis 22, verse 5. What are we doing? We are looking at every worship scenario in the Bible to identify these five things. I may I submitted the principle that I need to show you two or three scriptures where we see the worship instruction and we identify these five things. So I'm going to give you two, a historical account in the Old Testament and an account in the New Testament and then I'm going to bring it to you and I so that you can see what is the worship? Who is the worshiper? What is the worship? Where is the workshop? And what is the work machine? And then we go, amen. That's why I said today, there's not going to be a historical thing. Today, it's going to be a theoretical session. Because I want you to live with an understanding. So that when you by yourself, you can see that actually I can worship God when I'm at check house. Because yeah. you don't need a microphone to worship. You need awareness. Yeah. Genesis 22, verse 5. Then Abraham said to himself, to his young man, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. He says, we will worship and come back to you. So he said, I'm here to worship, right? Show me Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. Let's establish the text first, number 2. Matthew 2, verse 2. We want to identify these as scriptures that are talking about worship. Then we're going to quickly go through and see who is the recipient. Matthew 2, verse 2. The wise men say to the king Herod, where is the one born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship. So Abraham said, stay here with the donkey. Because I'm going to worship. The wise men say, we come from far. We have come to worship. So we're going to study these encounters, this account of worship. So we can see in this account of worship, do we have these five elements? Now, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. The one that we know. I urge you. I beseech you, brethren. I beseech you, brethren. By the mercy of God, that ye present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your what? Now, Paul brings it to a level now. Paul says, Abraham, that was, that, that was a natural. It, because the Old Testament, was it, the Old Testament gives us what it now, gives us the tangibles. But the New Testament gives us the teachables. So the Old Testament shows the practicals, but the New Testament gives us the spiritual. Now. So let's take it from the natural and to the spiritual. Now. Go back to Genesis 22 now. So now what are we doing here? Jesus, we want to identify the worship. Unto whom is this Jew? Genesis 22, verse 1. Let's see who's the one who's commanded the worship. The Bible says, verse 1. After these things, who? God. God. Did what? Tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am. Here. You see? Now, the worship, the recipient, the one who instructs worship, is not an ancestor. It's God. So in this account, now the first, we can see the first element. God. After this thing, who? God. Submit to you. That true biblical worship does not begin with the worshiper. It begins with the recipient. Any 
form of worship that doesn't begin with the recipient is unacceptable. Because there's no way you can guess what's in the mind of the recipient. You must wait on him to tell you what he wants from you. From Abraham, it was Isaac. But from you, it might not be Isaac. From you, it might be cut off skin son. It becomes personal. <laughs> so who is the worship? Abraham. But who, who, who is God commanding? The recipient is God. But God is commanding who? Abraham. Look at verse 2. Take your son, your only son, who? Isaac, from whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah. Offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains. I will show you. So verse 1 shows us the worship, which is God, and the worshiper, which is Abraham. Verse number 2 gives us the worship and the dating spot. Take now your son, meaning that which you bring unto God as your worship, it must be yours. You can't offer to God worship that you borrowed. Because if it's somebody else, it won't do the work in you. It will do the work in them. That's why, to be honest with you, praise God for the culture in the church that says, if Give your neighbor some money for them to give. It's a nice gesture. But the truth of the matter is, it's not your money. <laughs> so you're offering to God sacrifices that cost you nothing. That's what David refused. When the man, Aurona, said to David, King, take my land, take my oxen, and offer to God. David said, no, 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 no. I want to buy it from you. I will not offer to my God sacrifices that cost me nothing. Because if it's unto God, it must cost you something so it can do something. No wonder God says it must be yours. Your what? Your son. That which is your produce. That which is your effort. Oh my God. And go to where? The land of Moriah. Now, to all the babies in the house. <laughs> I know this is more people who make babies say this. Yes. By the way, I'm also Mubed. So, so, but we must, we, we must be careful with scripture. You know? When he says the land of Moriah, it doesn't mean where we come from in the book. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, I just thought, you see, this is the very committed saying, I should just hold it in. So, don't leave Cap and go to Moriah. You know, it doesn't mean that one, it means the one. No, yeah, just, just, just to be safe. The land in Moriah and offer, watch it. Look what God says, and offer him there. Meaning, anywhere else you have problems. We know the story. When Abraham got to the mountain, he was about to slay the, the boy. My time is up. He's about to slay the boy. God said to him, Don't harm the boy. And when he looked up, he saw a ram caught in a thicket. Where? Where God told him to go. Anywhere else, there wouldn't have been a ram. There's a reason why God gives you the meeting spot. Because the meeting spot, he has already placed provision. Before you arrived, anywhere else, God is absent, and in his absence, there's no provision. The reason why he says, watch it, oh my goodness, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering, watch it, on one of the many mountains that I will show you. So meaning when you worship, we must worship leaning on revelation. Mm -hmm. Worship waiting for instruction. Is this the spot now? If no, keep going. Is this the spot now? Keep going. That's why I worship teams careful. At times we prepare seven songs. But we might get the dating spot on the first song. Okay. Marawana, because we are thinking of number five. You leave the dating spot on the first song because we want you want us to hear your voice in track number three. But God has already landed on the first song. Once we feel, we sense that we are there. I'm sorry, we practice your song. 
But now, we've reached the dating spot. Because once we get to the place called there, nothing else matters. No one is sacrificing there. Because in any other song, we would have lost the blessing in the first song. We end up killing things that were not meant to die. Oh my goodness, my time is up. We end up killing things that were not meant to die. Why? Because we are, we are, full. We, we, we are thinking program that we desire to try to impress God while disobeying his guidance. That's why a lot of these worship nights, a lot of these worship nights, have you ever noticed, it's a lot of these worship nights, one music minister will get on the stage and they minister and you could say that, oh, this is the moment. Yeah. Oh, this is the, the one we came to meet has descended, has arrived, has arrived. But the one in Indonesia is a performer and I go post. I participate. <laughs> because you just can't believe. Oh, what is, is this it, man? <laughs> I'm not cool, you must be. <laughs> is this it? And then I'm, like, I'm not cool. And then the kitchen, I go MC. Why? We can't. I won't jump. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Because you are here to be seen. And no, no, no. You are called to see, not to be seen. Oh. oh. You are gone so God can reveal himself to you, not so he can see you. You've got nothing to show God, but he has so much to show you. So God is the worship. Abraham is the worshiper. Isaac is the worship. Isaac is the gift that is requested by God from Abraham. The mountain Moriah is the workshop. It's the dating spot. Now, Churchill, where is the workmanship? Where is the thing that Abraham is becoming? Look at verse number 16. And then we move on quick. Are you learning anything from this tonight? Amen. Stay with me. Look at verse number 16. After Abraham proved himself to God that I'm here to obey you, watch it. And the angel said, God said, By myself I have sown, says the Lord. Because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son. Next verse, watch it. I will indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the star in the sky. That's the workmanship. What God is saying here, here God now is, is establishing a promise he made in Genesis 15. When Abraham said, God, I don't have an heir. Are you telling me this slave will be my heir? And God said, no, 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 no. not the slave. Your son. God said, come out, look up the sky, count the stars. And Abraham said, I can't count them. God said, that's how much you're going to get. That's Genesis 15. God says, look at the seashore. Can you count the sand? He said, no. God said, that's how much. There's a promise God gave you. And you're holding on the promise. But it's in the place of obedient worship. It's when you have proved your allegiance or your loyalty to God where there is going to be sinned. That's the workmanship. Meaning God has started the work with the word, but he's going to finish it through your obedience. Utalen kes, Mario Pérez on the obedience. That's why Jesus started with the word. He was foretold, but he had to fulfill it with obedience on the cross. Everything that has been prophesied over your life is only your obedience away. That's why most of us have aborted our destinies through disobedience. You are busy rebuking the devil for something that your disobedience is responsible for. But tonight there's grace for restoration. Amen. Amen. Oh, my time is up. Let's look at Matthew chapter 2. Oh, maybe. Let me just give it to you because you know Matthew chapter 2. Because I want to close on, on Romans chapter 12 so that we deal with our spiritual so you can see where it is for us. Matthew chapter 2. The Bible speaks of the wise men who came to see the baby Jesus. Remember, the wise men did not have a great idea that there's something happening in Jerusalem. The Bible says an angel appeared to them and they were told about the baby. So God is the one who started the process. He told them that a child has been born. So they came to Herod looking for the child they were told about. The same way that Abraham did not wake up and decided, Isaac, I'm going to kill you. 
He was commanded. The wise men were also commanded. I'm trying to prove that worship does not begin with us. In worship, we are the respondents, not the initiators. Now take me to verse number 10 of Genesis, of Matthew chapter 2. Because I want you to see who is the recipient, who are the worshippers, what is the worship, where is the workshop, and what is the workmanship. Let's move on quick. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed because the star was pinpointed, was pinpointing the dating spot. Verse number 11, watch it. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. Stop right there. Now, this is where we need to be careful as worshippers. And I hope we're going to offend the other religions in the house. But it's the Bible. I mentioned that the overarching principle is that all elements must be right or the encounter is rejected. Now, with the wise men, on this account, there are two potential recipients. But you must know whom you were called to worship. The Bible says, enter in the house. They saw the child, one, which they were told about, with Mary, which Mary was the part of the discussion. So you better be careful in your worship of God that you don't give your gifts to things that you were not commanded about. Thank God about the Roman Catholics. All hail Mary. But it's my pleasure to let you know that you are missing the goal of worship. So the Catholics came into the house. They saw the child. And they passed the child. And they saw the man. And they offered him their worship. It is worship that they are offering. But we are wrong. They saw Mary. All hail Mary. Thank God for the silence. <laughs> they saw Mary. And you know what was their problem? Is that when they saw the child with Mary, his mother, they looked, oh, these are the kind, the people who bowed to Mary are the people who were not there when the true message was brought. These are the people who joined the journey in the middle. People who don't have a personal revelation. People who don't have a personal relationship so they can hear from the recipient himself. Because the angel did not appear to the wise men to announce Mary. It appeared to announce the baby. Remember verse number 10, if children show me verse number 2, they knew what they came here for. Because these worshippers came on the strength of the word. Look at verse number two. It saying, where is the one who has been born? Not the one who gave birth. We are not here for the one who gave birth. We are the one, we are here for the one who has been born. So they were clear as to who the recipient of their worship is. Therefore, as you worship God in your local churches, make sure that you don't miss God while worshiping your pastor. <laughs> don't miss the one who sits on the throne while you are busy honoring the angel of the house. We worship God and God alone. And I have a problem with church courage. I'm a, I'm a researcher of this study. This is my specialization. And I can tell you now, that you can see this culture in the church is so right. Watch it. When we start the worship service, the pastor is not in the church building. He's in the office. We are worshiping God. And some of the believers are just worshiping casual. But when the man of God walks in, there's, an, there's a sudden change of atmosphere. Because Mary walked in. The child has been trying to get your attention. Because the pastor is not here now. Even the worship team on the stage, oh, we just do it indeed. <laughs> but when we see the man of God, the angel walking in, we start to be serious. It's just clear that you've missed who the recipient is. Because if it was God, it should have been like that in his absence. Verse 11. Entering the house, they saw the child. But look at these guys who knew what they came for. Oh my goodness. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. And 
falling to their knees. It's still not clear. Because what she, Mary is holding the baby. But when they bow, it's not clear unto whom they bow it. Falling to their knees, they worship who? Him, not her. Not them. Because they, they are tired of what she was clear. I'm not here to impress the pastor. Whether he lift up his hands or not, I'm not here for him. I'm here to bless the Lord. Amen. A lot of worship leaders, churches, they come to me and say, Church, how do I lead worship when my pastor doesn't participate? Oh. Duh! He's not here for him. <laughs> Let him sit on the couch. Watch him go. That's why we came in the couch for you to sit. <laughs> Let him sit on the couch. Let him rest. I shall fall. You worship God. Because you're not, you're not here for him. You're here for the Lord. Yes. And that's why I wanted to bring you here. To show that there's a potential of missing the recipient of worship. Why are you looking for the response from the audience? And yet the one you're here to worship is waiting for your worship. In my church, when we worship at prayer, you're not here for them. You're here to worship God. Don't miss the target of your worship. That's what I wanted to come in. So now, the recipient is the baby. That's the worship. The worshippers are the wise men. The workshop is their house. I told you the dating spot is decided by the recipient. Now, what is the workmanship? Look at verse number 16. There's something in worship, in the activity that wants to alter the worshiper. Verse number 16. Uh, let me see, now take me verse number 15. I believe it's number 15. It's in worship when after you have done what God commanded you, then you will have an instruction. There's no way you can worship God and go back with the way you came in. Yeah. And here's the proof. He stayed there. No, 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 no. Let's go back. Verse number 14. Verse number 14. Pardon me. My mind is always saying, oh, don't close it. Don't close it. Verse number 14. Let me see that. The preceding verse. No, I think it's verse number 12. Let me see that. Because the Bible says, when they finished doing offering the worship, the same way God declared something to Abraham, if you give the recipient what he wants, he's got something to tell you about yourself. And being warned, who? The wise man. Because after they spoke to Herod, Herod says, go check the baby. And when you find him, come and give me the weight. So I can come and worship him. And he wanted to kill the baby. Yeah. It's when you worship God correctly, then God will give you a way. Don't go back to the people. And being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they return their own country by another route. There's no way you can worship the true living God and go back with the same route you came in. But if you go to Mary, you'll go back to people who are wrong for what you are offering. Are we together? Now, Churchill, this is the historical account of Abraham. This is the gospel. Where am I going to get Maria? Where do I fit in it? So Paul, in Romans 12, verse 1, now he's bringing this principle to us now. He says, I urge you, therefore, brethren, in view of God's mercy, to do what? To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. How? Holy and acceptable unto who? To God. Why? This is what is your spiritual worship. Now let's identify the five elements and I close on this. Just pray me. Give me about seven minutes. I'm going to close. Now, we need to identify the five elements now because this one now helps you and I to maintain what Abraham started. To maintain what the wise men practicalized. So you can know who is the recipient, who is the worshiper, what is the worship, where is the workshop, and what is the workmanship? Tell me. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies. Now, there, there's quite a lot there. In the, in, in the New King James, it says, I urge you, therefore, brethren. Now, a brethren, brethren is a term attributed to born again believers. Nzalwa. So when I say brethren, I imply that you have accepted Jesus. Mm -hmm. Sinners are not our brethren. They are brothers. 
The brethren me goes through the cross. If Jesus is not in your heart, you know the brethren, you are a brother. So Paul is speaking to, to, to people with regenerated spirit. Watch what he says. He says, I urge you to present your bodies. So the you that must present the bodies is not the body. The body is the thing that must be presented by the you. So who is the presenter of the body? Is the you. But what are you? You are the spirit. So this instruction is an instruction to your spirit man. That's why when I was here, I said, unless you are born again, you cannot worship. Because your spirit is dead. So there's no one to receive the instruction. So when he says, I urge you therefore, brethren, to offer your body, it means the body belongs, the body is the entity that belongs to you. So who is the you? The you is your spirit man. So that's why he says, this is your... Spiritual worship. Yes. Spiritual worship can be offered by physical beings. Spiritual. Non-material. So he's speaking to the non-material entity to offer this material thing. So who is being commanded? Is your spirit man. In this way become tricky for us. Is the spirit man. The spirit man is commanded to offer the body unto God as a spiritual worship. Say again. The spirit man is commanded to offer the body unto God. So God is the worship. Is the one to whom the body is offered. The body is the worship, the thing that must be brought. The spirit man is the worship. The one commanded. Now, church, in where's the workshop? Remember the principle of the workshop. The workshop is anywhere the recipient decides to be. So, in our context, where is God? I know you know. Say, He's within you. Don't you know that you're bored? When Jesus was speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4, He was giving her this revelation. That a time is coming where your lover is going to change the meeting spot. It's no longer in Jerusalem. It's no longer on the mountain. But it's going to come within you. Meaning in Genesis 2, when God was forming the body of, of Adam, he was building his resting place. But that place became unworthy when Adam sinned. And God left his place. And he gave us a tent as a temporary dating spot. When Jesus died and said, it is finished, he was saying, Father, I've cleaned your original spot. Come back. Let me say that again, that was too fast. When God formed Adam, when he was forming that body, he was forming his place of residence. This is the reason why there, there is a void in humanity that nothing else can fill except God. And God doesn't feel it. Trust don't feel it. Mind doesn't feel it. Sex doesn't feel it. I thought you say amen. Amen. You can have all these things as much as you want. When you don't say, hmm, they still have what? Because it was designed by God for Himself. It's only God who can come in you and say. Because he made it for himself. But when Adam sinned, he defied. And God says, I'm too holy to dwell. I'm too holy to crush on the son. I'm going to leave you to sin. And God left. No wonder the void that has been consuming mankind. Jesus came so he can clean the father's face. When he died and he paid the price, he said, did he? It is finished. No wonder. It's only after Jesus rose from the, from the dead, he said to the disciples, the Bible says, when he met them, he said, I give you. He bred unto them. And they received what? The Spirit. Receive. Receive. The word receive means to get. Receive. To get again. That's why we don't see the Holy Spirit. We really see. He used to be here. 
when you receive the Holy Spirit, it's not the first time he comes in. He was here, but he left because of defilement. Now that Jesus cleansed us up, we receive. He comes back to the place that he made for himself. So where is the meeting spot? Is in your boat. So who is the worshipped God? Who is the worshipper? Your spirit man. What is the worship? Your board. Where is the workshop? In your board. Question. If the recipient and the giver live in the same body, why do you have to wait for Sunday before you worship? I can't wait to get to church. I'm going to worship God. God doesn't dwell in buildings made by men's hands. He dwells in this temple that he made with his own hands. There's no church structure that can be big enough to accommodate God. That's why I wonder, my brother, people say, you see, today, I didn't sense God in the presence of the church. Duh! <laughs> There's no God to be found here. The presence you sense is the one you brought from home. So you are experiencing the God you have fellowship with on a daily basis. So if you don't have that, Sunday is all part of it. So what I felt something. Guess what? That was not the present. When you felt the goosebumps of music. That's why when the Samaritan woman said, where must we go to worship? She's asking Jesus, where must we go to worship? She was, the context, the question is about a place. He said, where is the right place to worship? Is it in Jerusalem or the mountain? She just said, worship. no, 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 no. A time is coming where both these places will become obsolete, will become irrelevant. And in response, Jesus said, a time is coming and now is. Where the true worshippers will worship the Father where? In spirit. When Jesus said in spirit, he was not saying. <laughs> no. Remember, remember the context of the question. It's location. So when Jesus said in spirit, it means the new location of God. It's not the physical temple in Jerusalem. It's not the mountain. But the new location is spirit. Why? Because God is a spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in the same location where he dwells. I know I'm saying too much and I'm saying too fast. Bear with me. But that's why we have a recording. We can go back and listen to it over and over again. So God is the recipient. Your spirit man is the worshiper. Your body is what is requested. The workshop is your body. What is the workmanship? I'm glad you asked. The workmanship is transformation to Christ's likeness. So, church, how do I worship? You worship by offering your body. When your body demands things that are in contrary to the will of God, you say no to your body. Worship is as easy as saying no to the suggestions of your body. It doesn't start with singing a song. It starts by saying no to sin. Not singing a song, but saying no to sin. When you lay your body on the altar and let it burn, when you say no to what your body demands, God in you says, that's my worship. Now, here's the problem. Abraham was able to offer Isaac, this is the part, because Isaac was, sub, was submitted to Abraham. Stay with me. He was able to offer Isaac because Abraham had authority over Isaac. The reason why some of us are struggling to offer the kind of worship that we are commanded here is because our Isaac has authority over us. That's why when Abraham got to the mountain, the Bible says he tied Isaac. Remember that? Isaac kept quiet. But he's under authority. He laid Isaac on the wood. 
try sleeping upon the wood. It's uncomfortable. But Isaac never said anything. He lifted up the knife to slay Isaac. Isaac saw the sharp knife. He never complained. Why? Because Isaac was under authority. This is the reason why. When we have declared a fast, a calf, and your Isaac says, Fulugu, <laughs> Instead, <laughs> instead of you turning your Isaac, your, your body ties your spirit. For as long as your spirit man is weaker than your body, there's no way you'll offer this kind of worship. That's my closing remarks. Therefore, you need to work on your spirit man. Work on your spirit man. How? Spiritual diet. Read the word. This is how you feed your spirit man. This is what gives your spirit man authority over the flesh. Prayer. Meditation on the way. This book of the law shall not depart from you. You shall meditate on it when? Day, not Sunday morning. The reason why our spirit are so malfunctioning is because it only gets fed one day a week. But your body gets fed every day. Your body eats Monday, Sunday, breakfast, lunch, supper, and everything in between. <laughs> but your spirit, man, only eat Sunday evening a calf. And when God calls you to worship, your, your body ties your spirit, man, and it offers you. How so? Let me show you. You have an edge to pray. Right? You have a desire to pray. And you say, today I want to pray. And then you close the door and you get in the room. You start praying. Father, you are good. You are with. And your body says, look at the clock. <laughs> there you are sacrificed. <laughs> your body says, oh, it's only been five minutes. I'm not laughing here. And you allow your body to offer your spirit as a living sacrifice. You cut off the prayer. Immediately when you finish saying, Father, you know my heart. <laughs> Lord, you know my heart. You know my desire. And God says, the recipient inside of you says, yes, I know your heart. Even, I know your heart. Weak, I know your heart. Malnutrition. I know your heart. Offered by your body. No wonder Paul says, there's a war in me. The things I want to do, I do them not. And the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing it. Why? Because there's a competition. Abraham is trying to offer Isaac, and your Isaac is standing up and saying, I'm in a crash. <laughs> and the prayer of my heart is, may God give me the grace so you can give him what he's commanded for me. Why the body? Oh, the time is long gone, forgive me. The reason why God commanded us to offer him the body is because God is a spirit, right? When Jesus told us to pray, saying, Pray, our Father who art in, yes. hallowed be thy, Amen. thy kingdom, Amen. thy will be Amen. on earth as it is in Amen. the will of God on earth can only be done by us who have physical bodies. So the reason why the command of worship is to offer the body is because it's through this body that his will can be effected in a physical world. Okay. Number two, let me close with this. Number two, if your body can be laid on the altar, there is nothing else that God can get from you. Mm-hmm. Fact, the money that's not giving you are saving, you are saving to feed the body. If the body is burning, then the man has got other things to take care of. The car you are driving, you are driving because you're trying to transport the boat. That's why if God can say, give your car. It's not your spirit that says age now, it's your boat. Because when you give, it's not your spirit that takes inconvenience. It's your boat. The house you live in, 
It's not needed by your spirit. The clothes you have in your wardrobe, it can't even close anymore. The shoes that you really know where's the other pair. The reason why you don't, you're not willing to give up what you have is because you're trying to save for. Even the food you're thinking about now. I'm trying to feed your spirit. But your body says, Cut on the bed. Cut on the bed. You see, you see, you see the bed. I'm trying to feed the worshiper. Every church service is a gymnasium for the worshiper. The thing that says, Ah, I'm not going to give you a first aid. I'm not going to give you a first aid. Listen, listen, listen. I'm not justifying going over the time. But I'm trying to show you a perfect. Oh, it is not your spirit that is in a hurry to leave. No, 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 no. Your spirit is in the best place it can be. It's the body. It's your body that is rushing to go wash the shagar you left. Not your spirit. So God says, there's so much that I want to do on earth through you. But the hindrance between what I want and what and it happening is your inability to keep your body under subjection. No wonder Paul in 2 Corinthians 9.27, he says, I keep my body under. I, who? The spirit man. I'm in control here. I'm in control. You see, you see me now? I'm so tired. I mean, I drove two and a half hours to meet me back in the morning. God, then I preached for 90 minutes. I drove another two and a half hours coming back. I just got home, 30 minutes to drink water. I'm back at Kevin, I'm preaching. Why? Because the spirit man is in charge. The spirit man is, my boy, his company is standing here. He says, you're killing me. And I said, Shara, you are a sacrifice. <laughs> Train your spirit to regain control over your body. You need to train your spirit to regain control over your body. Paul says, why do I keep my body under? He says, so that after I have preached, oh, please preach it for me, let me sit on this one. He says, after I have preached so much, listen, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, chapter 9, 27, or 729, somewhere there, I think you're the part of my notes for today. He says, I'm full with him after I have preached. Like, after Chechi has come here and he has preached, the only thing that can disqualify me is you hearing that I've done things with my body that violate what I've been teaching you. Paul says, there's a potential in this body to erase everything you've worked hard to build. Second Corinthians, yes. it's first Corinthians chapter nine. chapter nine twenty seven. Yes, this is the reason why God wants you to offer the food because He can disqualify you. When Jesus was in Gethsemane and Jesus was saying, "Father, this cup is bitter," it was not the Spirit that was crying because the Spirit was not going to help on the cross. It's the board. Instead, I discipline my board and bring it under. It's the same Paul. Now that he said, offer your body, he's telling us what it means now. When I close that, like I said, when I come back, I want to show you the day-to-day -day application of worship. You, what makes you a worshiper is not the slow songs you sing on Sunday. It's you being able to keep this thing under strict control. So bad after I've sung the slow song. After I said, you are holy with my lips. Preach to others. I myself will not be disqualified. And it breaks my heart to see a lot of us music ministers, and, I, and, I, and I'm going to pick on us because I am dead. So I'm not offending anybody. I'm speaking what I know. I think it really in these things. I've got enough evidence. We get to our worship night. We sing about his holiness on the stage. But when we get on the stage, we are disqualified by unrighteous 
hate it. We sing about something which we don't do. Some of us come to church to play keyboard and yet we smell of alcohol. If you don't offer this boy, he's going to disqualify you. No wonder Paul says, offer it. So that's why you don't have to wait for Sunday morning to start worship. The instruction has already came out. The question is, when are you going to start? Because the recipient is in you. The worshiper is your spirit. The worship is your body. The place is in your body. And when you keep your body under strict control, that's when Christ's likeness starts to show up. Let this mind that was in Christ be in you. And how did he master his worship? When he was being beaten, he never said a mumble word because his body was under strict control. Pray of my heart is that after you have served the calf, after you've attended every calf service every Sunday night and Friday night, you are not disqualified by your body. You are not disqualified by the things you do with your body. When we don't see you. Because even if we don't see you, you are doing it in full view of the recipient. Because Because You have me. <laughs> <laughs> so you see how stressed it is? Because if I go and sleep around, I sleep with the Lord in me. No wonder David says, Wherefore can I run away from you? Because if I go hide in Hades, you are there. Because my body took you with me. How good is that I'm going? is the least of your problem. You took God with you to the place. So the prayer of my heart, then let's hear the instruction. Be ye holy. The reason why some of us lose the ambition and the anointing is because of the way we treat God's dwelling place. Keep it all. So holiness is our fashion. And tonight, hence I said, I don't want a whole lot of things. And I want to leave it as quiet as it is. So you can process this. And say that to worship, you don't need a song, you don't need a keyboard. But it's just awareness. Now once you become God inside minded, everywhere you are, even if somebody steps on your toes, how you respond becomes an offering of worship unto God. That's why you have no right to give anybody a piece of your mind. Because the mind that you should be having is that which was in Christ. Somebody read the scripture here that says, if somebody slaps you this side, you don't slap them back. You must give the other one. That is how worship works. You have lost the moment to worship God right there. Worship is it's so close as how you live your daily life. By the time we gather here on Sunday, on Sunday, we must express in public who we are in private. The worship, the worship, the worship, the workshop, and the workmanship. Because the true goal of worship is not to be become like Christ. No wonder when Paul reads in the second verse, he says, "Therefore, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed how by the renewing of your mind with what through the word of God." It's when you eat on the weight that your spirit man becomes strong. So you can do what Paul says. I keep my body under strict control. So as I live together with the outgoing ex Amen. <laughs> the prayer of my heart. No, I don't mean it the last time you see me, depending on what God lays in the unit later council. But the prayer of my heart is that all of us we will live the life that becomes a pleasing aroma unto God. Amen. The decisions that we take will be decisions that heaven is proud of you. The prayer of my heart that may God clear every day, the way you treat people, may God say, well done, good and faithful servant. 
The way you behave even in the lecture class. May God say, well done, good and faithful sir. Because it's our body believers that makes us as born again academics look like we don't have God in our lives. You know you are employed for work, but instead of you working, you are busy speaking in tongues. Out of all. <laughs> you are at the call center. Instead of answering calls, you are busy. Shut up. You better get fire. Speaking in tongues. Keep your body under strict control. And let everything you do become a pleasing aroma to God. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you for opening up our eyes to the truth of your way, O God. That we don't have to go anywhere to study worship. But thank you for making us aware tonight that as we are seated here as individuals, we are a living, working worship experience. The prayer of my heart is that may worship the rat in our lives. May worship the rat anywhere we are, oh God. Every decision that we take may be a decision that glorifies you, oh God. Everywhere we go, may people are born and cause Thank you, Lord, for even giving us this moment tonight that we will learn from your word, O oh God. Pray, Father God, that this word will help us to live in accordance to the call, to live so holy that our lives, O oh God, will be a prism aroma before you in the name of Jesus. And everybody say, Amen. God bless you. Amen. Amen.